It's Scott Garlis at Sansbury Research. I'm here at the 2019 Alliance Conference in Las Vegas. I'm here with Vitaly Katznelson. Scott? Vitaly, how are you? Great, thank you. Vitaly is the CEO and Chief Investment Officer at IMA. Uh, so, Vitaly, what is your opinion on the stock market's valuation currently? So I think the stock market's overvalued somewhere between enormous and tremendously. And uh, let, me, let me quantify this for you. you, know, how, do you when, how do you really yeah, feel? No, this, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like when you're five years old and you play a game with somebody, you're like, my number is 10 and your friend says, oh, mine is 15. And then you run out of numbers and you say, you know, if mine is infinity. And says, so mine is infinity plus five and it keeps, go, keeps going. Well, what happens when the stocks become expensive? And you say, well, the stocks are expensive, and the next year, and they then keep going higher. And you say, well, last year they were expensive, but that was tremendously expensive. This year they are enormously expensive. Well, I mean, if you look at the stock market overall, we are basically trading at the levels that arrival in 1999 or pre-Great Depression. So that's very expensive. Can they go higher? Why not? You know, at this po at this point, the kind of rationality, you know. Uh, at this point, it's very difficult to see when it stops. But the overall stocks are very, very expensive, yes. Anything's possible, right? Exactly. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, so, and then where would you rather have your money right now? I think it's, you know, I'll tell you what I do, okay? And uh, I, you know, we, our default position is short-term treasuries, okay? And then we're looking to buy high-quality companies and we want to buy them cheap, okay? In the absence of this, in the absence of finding high quality companies that are cheap, I would rather have my money in cash. So this is not me trying to time the market because I think it's incredibly difficult to do this and I, you can't really turn it into process. But one thing you can do, you can value individual companies. You can identify which companies are gonna you know, have sustainable business models. And my goal is to kind of put a portfolio of, you know, of high quality companies that are undervalued. And then if I can't do this, not to make a forced decision to buy something, but I would rather have cash waiting for opportunity to buy those companies if I can't have a portfolio of them. Yeah, especially if you think it's incredibly overvalued. Yes. That, that yeah. opportunity is yeah. going to be coming. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. at some point. You don't know when. Yeah. And by the, way, it's, it doesn't mean, by the way, it doesn't mean that the, first of all, it doesn't mean the stock market has to have a tremendous decline. You may have pockets of weakness. Okay? But also, like, if you are an investor, U.S. is not the only market. If you don't want to be the Indiana Jones of investing, and you don't want to buy companies in Iraq, you don't have to. You know, but you can also buy companies in the UK and in, in a whole bunch of other countries where there was a rule of law, where you feel safe traveling to, et cetera. So it's a, you have opportunities coming from time to time in those markets as well. So. Fair. Huh? Pretty fair. What's your opinion on cryptocurrencies? So it's kind of interesting. So I, I look at crypto, cryptocurrencies as a kind of millennial gold. Okay. In other words, it's a like millennials don't like shiny objects anyway. Like you know, you don't see them wear a lot of jewelry, etc. Okay. And uh, and gold. Like if I want to give you a million dollars of gold, I need to have a, a few body, you know, a few bodyguards, and uh, it's it's probably fairly heavy that I haven't you know, seen a million dollars of gold. But but I'm sure it's you know it's 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 it's, it's not a very convenient transaction. Where with cryptocurrency, I just give you a thumb drive, and it could have a billion dollars for that matter. So, and it's very digital, kind of very high, 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 it's like, it's like I gold. Let's call it I gold from now on. Um, so the, the problem with cryptocurrencies, like you have no idea what they're worth. Really, is Bitcoin worth $20,000, 20 million, or five? Well, you know, and so the problem is, as an investor, when I buy an asset, I want to be irrational, okay? If, if, if I buy a stock and it declines, sometimes I may have to sell it, sometimes I will buy more, sometimes I will do nothing. But at least I'm able to make a rational decision through analysis. With cryptocurrencies, you really can't do that. And so the, you know, yes, Bitcoin is finite. So the, you know, it's because, you know, everybody loves that it's finite. You can only have so many Bitcoins. But number, the number of cryptocurrencies are not finite. So you can have Bitcoin one, two, three, and four. So I can see how probably 20 years ago, Bitcoin, let's say we had the technology to create it then, Bitcoin would not be possible because you did not have central banks at the time destroying global currencies the way they're doing it now, right? Uh, but today, I, I, I kind of get it why, it's, why it exists. Is it an investment? Um, like we are in Las Vegas right now, and to me, I would approach buying currencies the same way you approach 
going to the casino downstairs. You probably put as much money to it as you can afford to lose, and you treat it as that. It's not, it should not be, it should not be uh, your allocation to it, should be, if you have it. It should be in basis points, not, not in percentages. Right. And I can see, too, how on the transaction side, somebody accepting Bitcoin, they would have a hard time with that because the price can be so volatile, and today it could be worth this, and tomorrow it could be worth much less. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And there was another, there was actually there was a very interesting bear case to uh, Bitcoin, is that governments you know, love the ability to make promises and not to keep them. And what I mean by this, politicians make us promises, and when they can't keep them, they just print more money. So the governments value that. Yeah. That to them, it's the, the uh, ability to print money is incredibly important. And uh, Bitcoin, competes with that, okay? Government wants to have a monopoly on money, okay? So therefore, if governments will look at it, you know, if Bitcoin becomes big enough to matter, the, the governments will declare a war on it because I think it's, its existence would undermine their power. So that's, that's another reason why I'm not a big fan. That's fair. And so would you say you have a similar type view on precious metals? You were talking about how, you know, Maybe you couldn't see investing, but now with governments trying to pump more liquidity into the system and putting more money out there. And yeah, so the, uh, I'll give you a little bit bigger answer than this. There was a great book called The Sapiens. And the book basically tells you how everything around us is a story. Money is a story, right? If you think about it, like, uh, when, you, when you're born and you see your parents going to the store and buy milk, they give 20 dollars to the clerk, he gives you money, you know, he gives you milk, and, you know, so you see this. So money is kind of a universal story. Paper money is a universal story. It doesn't really exist in nature, right? It's something we created and we all agreed that it exists, right? So we agreed that fiat money is the currency. Like that's, that's, you know, that's the story that's accepted by everybody. However, so gold has, you know, gold is, you know, is a story that's accepted by a very large, you know, well, a portion of the society, but not everybody, okay? So I could see how, go so the, if you and I talked five years ago, I would have given you a very, like the answer would have been, um, gold, um, as a value investor, I have no idea, gold doesn't have cash flows, I have no idea what it's worth, and it would be similar to my cryptocurrency answer is that I wanna be, you know, I wanna remain rational, okay? Today, there's a little uh, asterisk next to it. Today, I can also see how we have $17 trillion of debt that has negative interest rates. Crazy. We have governments that actively, you know, destroying the currencies by having negative, you know, when you have a, this much negative yield. And by the way, you know, let's say, if you think about it for a second, if I give you $100 and you pay me back 90, that's called a default. That's not called negative interest rates. So we have basically governments to some degree defaulting on that debt, you know, today. And so in this world, I can see how gold could be some kind of part of the portfolio. Again, not the portfolio, but a bigger part, you know, maybe a more meaningful part of the portfolio, I don't know if, you know, in, in, yeah. a, in, a, in a few percentages. Uh, that's not something I would have told you five years ago, even three years ago. So that's, so my, I, I evolve, you know, with negative interest rates, I guess, so. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's fair, it just, and what, what's crazy is, it, is high as the stock market is, and then all these governments are talking about possibly printing more money right now because economies are slowing down. And you have central banks that are pumping a lot of money, and it just, it, it, it's hard to turn your head away from that. Well, I think in, you're absolutely right. And what's, what's also happening is that when, if you think about it, over the last 10 years, the government debt has doubled in the yeah. US and in many other countries as well. And the interest rates are either negative or all-time lows. So in the past, when you had a recession, you had a central banks had abilities to lower interest rates. We got to the point, the only thing they can do is actually make them negative. Yeah. And so negative interest rates don't fit any, into any kind of, the kind of the, like imagine like the laws of physics suddenly stop functioning, like the, everything you knew about physics, uh, you know, the, the, the key equations, the assumptions, suddenly disappeared. And that's what basically happens when you have negative interest rates. Suddenly, things don't make sense. And it's, yeah, so I think gold is not as crazy as, you know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's very fair. And then lastly, what would be your one piece of advice for investors? I think the, in the, when the market continues to go up for 10 years, it's very easy to think that this time is different. It's 
very easy to think that what kind of draws straight line from the past into the future. And I would say draw straight lines, except don't look last 10 years, but look over the last 100 years. And if you look over the last 100 years, and by the way, I'm talking in my book, because I wrote a book called The Little Book. Can I so promote myself a little bit? Please. I wrote a book, The Little Book of Sideways Markets, where I discussed that. But if you look over the last 100 years, then you, it's going to give you a different perspective. It's going to give you a perspective that historically when markets went up very fast for as long as, you know, as we have, the markets that followed were not bull markets, but at least sideways markets. Okay? So the, the point is this. Today, every time you make a decision, don't feel like you have to make it. Don't feel like you have to buy the stock. Every just, you know, when you make forced decisions, and I feel like a lot of people making these decisions today, they feel like they have to be in the stock market. Those decisions are usually are not good decisions because everybody else around you making them. You know, and so that means that everybody else is buying not uh, for fundamental reasons, but because they they, they had to. In '99, you had to own dot coms, and if you didn't, you would have been left behind. And I think the today when people are just buying index funds, it's you know they they basically they they they, they think they see safety in numbers. In other words, you buy a, you know, a fund and it has hundreds of stocks, you feel diversified. The problem is if you own something, you know, yes, you might have reduced the risk of one company going bankrupt for whatever reason, but if you buy a basket that's very expensive, it can still decline 30%. Okay, so it's a, there is no safety in numbers when you, get, you know, when you own a lot of overvalued assets. And I think that's what happens to a lot of index fund investors today. So my argument would be just don't make forced decisions. And when you look at history, step back and don't just look for the last 10 years, but look over the last 50, 100 years, and you realize this time is really not different. Okay, so. so if you can tell yourself the fear of missing out is starting to play part of your investment process, that's a bad thing. Yes. You don't. Yeah, you you, don't. yeah you know, when, when, a lot of, when everybody's making decisions you know, based on that, on that fear, yeah. the next, they, it will be replaced on the fear of losing money. Yeah. So they, it's one fear usually replaces the other because emotional decisions usually followed by another emotional decision. Yep. So because there is no foundation, there is no solid gr ground, uh, you know, under it. So yes. Vitaly, thank you very much for your time. It's my pleasure. Thanks, Scott. Certainly. Thank you. Guys, thanks for watching, and stay tuned for more updates and interviews.